So today we'll be having three sessions, and basically now the session together here, and uh, <clears throat> it'll be a common session, and afterwards we'll we'll get to know you. You'll have to introduce yourself right now, but uh, we'll get to know you and what level of expertise you are in. If you are a first timer, basics, then again if you are a middle, medium level, if you would like to learn more. And so after the second session we'll divide up. You know, those who are into basics, then they'll be here. And those who are into uh, advanced level, they'll go inside over there. Uh, I think you, you kindly introduce yourselves. Let us start off with uh, right here in the front and go like that. Yes. Hi, I'm Nikul for Pera Research. Hello. My name is Ramyam, and I'm from Dimapur, and I'm from LF Church. LF Church. Okay. I'm Timren, from Pera Research. I'm Visual El Hibo, I'm from Pera Research. My name is Piyo Tudo and I'm from Midland Baptist Church. My name is Isigo and I'm from Midland Baptist Church. My name is Vika Jo. I am from Midland Baptist Church and this is my first time. Hello everyone, my name is Chuba and I'm a beginner. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chosa Zakejo. I'm from Chasamadis Church, right now. That's the beginning. Hello, everyone. I'm Mego, and I'm a beginner from City Church. Hi, my name is Vito Po, and I'm from UBC, and I'm a beginner. Hello, everyone. My name is Moa, and I'm from Powerco, and yeah, in the beginner level. My name is Tijamato, I'm from Ebenezer Baptist Church. Hello, my name is Kedio and I'm from Ebenezer Baptist Church. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Junzo and I'm from Ebenezer Baptist Church. Hello, my name is Mr. El Kino and I'm from Ebenezer Baptist Church. I'm Reverend Tangalo from Pumoy Baptist Church. Thank you. Okay, so now I hand over the time to Richard and Ryan. Yeah, it's good to have each one of you here and everyone's big now. So, so it's good and we're gonna, we're gonna get you and teach you, teach you some of the stuff that's uh, uh, really from the basic of sound engineering when it comes to for cabling, to, to setting up sound, to setting up equipment. And I would like to know if you if you are already doing something with some church in audio if you can just you know just feel free to communicate with me you can stand up and talk to me there's no no way you know it's not a i think just feel free to talk and communicate so if you are doing something with sound already in the church uh you can just let me know the kind of equipment you're using and the kind of sound that you're doing in the church anyone in my church I want the sound system. Okay. Yeah, this one. Okay. Uh, we'll start with basic, and you can take down notes and stuff like that. And you, if you, at any point of time you want to ask a question, you can go ahead and stand up and ask, and we will fill you in with all the details. Right? Yeah, but feel free to talk. I mean, it's okay. I mean, you don't have to just sit so quiet. I mean, <laughs> talk to me. Okay, talk to us, and, and we will help you. You know, down the down the session. All right. All right. There are two types of. Uh, uh, sound setups that you can do. One is uh, for indoor and one is for a live performance. So setting up an indoor system you can use a passive or you can use active speakers. Active is uh, our speakers which have already built in uh, power amps and stuff like that. So you just need a, a mixer to run it through and and uh, you, you uh, for, for a normal system that is uh, uh, passive you need amplifiers, you need a board, you need stuff like that to hook up. Now, there are different types of boards that you can use, analog and digital. There are different types of equalizations that, you, that are on the board, depending on the kind of model you buy. So, these are the kind of things that, that are there in the boards. But some of the churches only have amplifiers and just direct microphones where you plug in and you don't have a mixer and just a couple of speakers and, a, and that's how you do your sound. But at any point of time you want you want to expand, you want to uh, 
uh, set up a different system. We're going to teach you how to do that. Uh, so you can you can get a mixer, you can get a, a, a different kind of microphones that you can use for choirs. Since you're all from church, for choirs there are different microphones. For solos there are different microphones, and uh, uh, for miking of instruments there are different kind of microphones. So these are the things that are uh, used for uh, choirs and stuff like that, or for live performances. But live performances you have a different setup where you have. Uh, a three-way system or a, take a three-way system because uh, analog let's say analog analog is uh, the older system that we used to use earlier and now it's all changed to digital but analog systems uh, where you use crossovers and you use a, a whole lot of processors different type of processors where you have a, a crossover where you can break up into the low frequencies the mid frequencies and the high frequencies so you have a three-way system where where you can actually um, uh, uh, separate your, your your mid and high and low frequencies. So when you run the sound, um, you use crossovers. The setting of the crossovers, the cutoff points <coughs> and stuff. That is what we will show you. All right, on on uh, on the once we get the net back. So these are the kind of things that uh, are involved in live and studio performance. Now live also you have monitoring, which runs to the mixer and, uh, uh, from uh, from different sends from the board for a fallback. So, in a church, you use four back. You have monitors. Let me say monitor speakers, where you put monitors. If you want to run back monitors, that's a different setup again. So you have a different uh, setup for, for for that monitoring system. So we're gonna we're gonna show you and explain to you how to use uh, monitoring and setting time delays between the main system and the monitor, so you don't get a double sound. You don't get interference. You don't get feedbacks. We're gonna show you how to do anti feedbacks and stuff like that. So. So uh, it all runs really good without a, 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 any of the system giving you a problem. Then we, we are, I'm going to show you, I'm going to teach you how to do uh, uh, troubleshooting, where you have, you know, when you're running a system, sometimes there's a noise in the system and you kind of, you don't know where it's coming from. So you got to run around and find. But the easiest way is if you know your cabling and stuff like that, how to make your cabling, how to configure the connections in the cables in the connectors, kind of connectors that you use for the system. And uh, and these these are the things that help. Where you use balance inputs, unbalanced inputs for guitars, it's a different uh, different connection for a microphone. It's a different connection. So you know, miking amplifiers, miking taking line outs from using DI boxes and stuff like that is what you need to know. So these are the things that are being used now. I, I'm sure in your church, all of your churches, there is a sound system. All right. So, give me, talk to me. Tell me what are the things that you've heard on that on that system. What are the problems that you are having in the church? And I'll try, try and help you, so you can go back to your church and help them. So, if anyone has a, a question or anyone has a, a thing, you can go ahead and ask me. No one. Okay, maybe. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the main challenges or struggles that we face in the church is um, handling the feedbacks and the noise that come out from the uh, output speakers. So, uh, I mean, like I've, I'm not that much of an experience, um, uh, don't have that much experience in handling sounds and all that, uh, but um, I've tried to work around that and uh, trying to place the monitor speakers, um, you know, trying to find that uh, sweet spot where you don't have uh, the feedbacks coming out, but okay. still, then, yeah, you know, still struggle with that. So, okay. Uh, how many of you are musicians here? Um, Anyone? Guitars, keyboard, drums? Anyone? Sort Tell of. Me. Here. Guitars. <laughs> Anyone else? Musicians? Good. I think most of you guys are somewhere uh, connected with uh, music. So, so getting f settling your feedback is depending <coughs> the distance between your microphone and your your monitor. Let's say a monitor, if you're getting your feedback from the monitor, you check your, your, your monitoring there and you have to actually cut off the frequencies that are disturbing you. Yeah, so we've got stuff here that he'll show you. And we'll put it up on the screen so you can see it and you can uh, get to know how it's <coughs> actually done. So what's the, what's the kind of setup you have at, at your church? Do you have a choir or do you have a... Musicians, yeah, uh, we have the choir and uh, the worship band also. Okay, and 
Um, I think especially with the choir, we use uh, three how condenser many mics. Choir, how many voice choir do you have? Uh, around 20 to 25. 20 to 25. And how many microphones do you use? You're probably doing parts, you're doing uh, your soprano, tenor, yeah, alto, yeah, and all the parts. Separate. So, yeah. uh, have you got them separated or do you have them all together? We have them all together in one place. All together in yeah, one place, yeah. but do you mm -hmm. have your, your, your altos in one section? And yeah, yes, yes. All right. So, how do you mic them and what kind of. Uh, uh, Right now we are using three condenser mics, uh, which we hang from the top, uh, okay. from the ceiling, and uh, we have about four dynamic mics uh, in front of the choir. Okay. Um, I think the problem mostly comes from um, trying to, uh, uh, um, you know, increase the volume of the uh, condenser mics. Uh, that's where the feedbacks come from, and uh, and I've been trying trying to you know uh, work that out, but I, it just seems quite impossible for me at the moment so okay. so what kind of, what is the, what board are you using are you using mixer or yes and uh, Mackie analog mixer Mackie analog. Yeah. Okay. what's the model that you use uh, I forgot actually it's yeah. MK something 20 or something like that I remember actually okay. um, condensers and uni directional mics you know, uh, when they cancel out each other and stuff like that, you get a lot of mm. things happening with the microphones. Okay. So we will we'll show you how to do, how to okay. get rid of the feedbacks. And do you, are you using an equalizer? Uh, yes. How many band equalizers are you using? Uh, I think it's a 12 band, I think. 12 or 10, I don't remember. It's, okay. it's around there. Faders, how big are the faders? Is it uh, big or small faders? Uh, they're big, big faders. Anyone else? In our church, we use in inverter. Inverter. Okay. So uh, when current goes up, it is one sound. Okay, that's because the voltage is low. Yeah, the voltage is not correct. So when the voltage is low, it's like a humming sound that comes from the system. It's not able to take the load. Uh, the, the problem which, are, which we are facing is uh, it's not able to match with our mixture, which is Studio Master. Okay. We're using Studio Master. Okay. So the high frequency is too high. Even if we cut up to up to zero, uh, it's still high. Okay. So that's the problem we're facing right now. Okay. So any solution to that? Okay. Anything on cabling? If you want to know anything on cabling configuration, how to make your cables, how to do soldering, how to do this, please ask me. I'll tell you how to do it. It's very important your cabling is correct, or you can have the best of system and it will never work correctly if your cabling is bad. Okay, hi guys. My name is Ryan. Uh, I'll be conducting you all the advanced and basics of audio engineering. Okay, um, so does any one of you have uh, like basic knowledge on audio engineering, like uh, basics as in equalization, dynamics, connections, knowledge on hardware, amplification, <coughs> speakers, any of that sort of stuff? Everyone's blind. <laughs> you guys have for audio engineering class. See, I think uh, I will just my suggestion. I will tell you. Uh, basically, I'm not into this sound system stuff. Okay. I'm basically I'm a photographer. Right. But uh, our church needed, I mean, someone to look after the system. Right. So that's why I just volunteered to help out with the uh, sound system without knowing anything. Right. So we have a mix here which uh, basically I do volume control. Wiring, everything is done by others. So sometimes I face problem because I don't know how is the connection. Because we use Ampli, Ampli also. So we have both uh, active and passive. So sometimes I get confused with the uh, connection. So that is my problem. And uh, of course, I, I don't know much about uh, the uh, microphone and all this thing and a different kind of mixture, sound system. All right. So basically I'm here just to all right. All right. know. So if when you are teaching maybe some pictures, if you show maybe... Uh, what, what we'll do is, what we'll do is, see I'm here to go on a one-to-one -one basis. I can sit with you, give you a, uh, a short time and you know, work with you on that part. Mm -hmm. So you get to know, if I just put it up on the screen and you take notes, you go back, you learn learning things. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm willing to sit with you for even 10, 15 minutes. In fact, if each one of you. So if you have anything, I'll sit with you. And I'll teach you how to do it. All, all, both of us will, will teach you how to do it. So you don't have to worry about it. So just give us a rundown of what you have and we'll, we'll, okay. we'll take it from there. Okay, um, what is sound? 
any rough idea from y'all's point of view? Disturbance causing the air. I've got a lot of answers to that as noise pollution. So, um, now sound is vibration. Okay. It travels through air, distance, meter, solid, liquids, things like that. Now, this, my presentation here, it shows you the exact um, figures of sound and dispersion, how, it's, how it travels, how you listen to it, the decibels, the time it takes to reach your ears. Okay, a lot of you guys have problems in feedbacks, like I heard you saying earlier. Now that is caused because of frequencies that are not required. How many of you all know what is the GEQ? No? Okay, now if you take a look at it, this is what sound looks like when it travels. Although you can't see it, you can hear it. But in my table, this is how sound travels. You have a plus point of sound traveling and you have a minus point. So everything is on a plus and minus. So the higher the waves, the bigger the wavelength, the louder the sound. You guys are used to putting up a fader, turning a few controls and fine. Right or wrong? <laughs> Someone respond. We are in an audio class. At any point, feel free to stop me, ask me a question, <coughs> I'll clear your doubts. So that once you go back and head behind the console, it becomes easier for y'all to understand what is there in front of you and what you're working with. Yeah. So if you have any issues, any complicated questions, please ask me. Now, sound is vibration. Vibration travels through walls, it travels through air. And depending upon how your atmosphere is, the sound changes. In a cold environment, your sound is completely different. In a hot environment, it's completely different. And in a rainy environment, it's completely different. Okay. Now mixing is a process where we have multiple inputs, we have single inputs. Okay. Now, what we have in single inputs and multiple inputs, we have something called as a channel strip on our mixers. As you all have used, whoever has used a mixer and whoever has not, you have something called as a channel strip where you have on a basic mixer. A channel strip is something where you have a gain control, you have an equalizer, you have uh, two auxiliary sends, you have an effects, you have something called as a pan, which is a balance between your left speaker and your right speaker. Okay? Now, uh, once we get this on screen, I'll just explain to you what the individual knobs do. Now, we have a 16 channel mixer. Now, these are 16 individual inputs. In your 16 individual inputs, you have something called as your channel strip. This is your channel strip. Okay. Now, in your channel strip, this is your gain control. Okay. So basically, this is your input. Okay. So this is where your uh, audio feed is coming in from. Let it be a mic or a guitar or any instrument. Okay. So this is where your input comes in. It's a balanced in. Then we have something called as an unbalanced input, which is your phono jacks. This is line level input. So line level input is a little less. The gain on that is a little less. Then we have our cutoff switch, which is a low frequency cutoff. So go back to the mixer. Go back to the. Mixer. So you have a low, uh, a low cut, okay, at 35 hertz, and then you have your gain control. So your gain control, what this gain control does is it amplifies the input, the signal that's coming from your source is being amplified through this control. Okay. You have two sets of controls. One is your input line level and then comes your equalizer. Okay. This is your EQ. You have, this is a four band equalizer where you have a mid sweep parametric. Okay. Now. This is your high frequency. This is the gain of your mid frequency. And this is the frequency that you want to choose your mid at. Okay. Then you have something called as a low frequency, which is your base. So basically you have highs, mids, 
and lows okay then you have two auxiliary sense which is your monitors on stage to make whoever is on stage listen to whatever they're performing or vo voice music whatever it may be then you have your balance which is your which is the left speaker and the right speaker then you have a mute button you have a pfl which is your headphones and then you have a fader so basically your input gain is your line level input where is the source so this is what you play with you set this to how much input you want in your control okay so the ma as much as input as you want then comes your equalization how you want it to sound this is very important the equalizer part is very important because without this by sending sound to a monitor you'll have feedbacks what you were talking about so if you know what the sound of your speaker is then you equalize to that you equalize your speaker your input instruments to according to whatever um, it sounds like so that you don't have a feedback okay then comes your monitoring after your equalization then your balance then you put, place it on whichever speaker you want your left speaker your right speaker and then it comes down to how clean you want your mix to sound so the cleaner it is and the the way it's equalized it sounds much better any questions okay so like i was saying you have two types of speaker configuration as well you have active speakers you have passive speakers now in passive speakers you have different kinds of models of passive speakers then you need a crossover you need a graphic equalizer then you need an amplifier then comes your mixer so these are the basic stuff of a, of a passive system in an active system it's all built in mm -hmm. your crossover points and everything already set so that's the difference between your active and passive um no one knows what's a g eq no no <coughs> okay now a graphic equalizer is a device where you have 31 different frequencies okay right from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz and within that bandwidth you have a bunch of frequencies that disturb you during your event or your sound check which needs to be cut off okay let's get to the basics of sound like i was explaining earlier you have a mic you have a microphone which is your source right so your source is either a uh, a microphone or a guitar or a bass guitar or whatever it may be whatever instrument it may be then we have a mixing console then you have a digital signal processor okay a dsp controller then we have an amplifier and then comes your speakers so uh, most of you will be confused trying to figure out what is a digital signal processor i'll get to that a little later in the session in the second half but as of now um, you have a mixing console okay without any processing that's going directly into your amplification correct so how do we fix that how do we any idea how do you correct a speaker that's not been equalized or treated properly without any uh, processing to it okay like i was explaining earlier your graphic equalizer and your mixer um if you understand what the graphic eq does you can make a speaker sound good and you can cut off all your feedbacks and all the disturbance noises not required in your mix okay so uh, these are like uh, the basics of analog both that we use and we got a midas we have an allen and heat we have a soundcraft we have a yamaha two different models of a yamaha so each board has a different kind of equalizer on it now you have a normal equalizer we have a parametric equalizer a parametric equalizer has a frequency ratio where you can 
select a particular frequency and cut it. Now frequencies are um, signals that are being produced that are not required in your mix. So you can use the GEQs on your board to correct that. Okay. So every board has a different kind of GEQ on the, sorry, a, a parametric EQ, like if you take the Midas console, you have a 6 band equalizer. If you take the Yamaha, you have a 3 band equalizer. If you take the Allen and it, you have a 4 band equalizer. So every board, the bigger the consoles get, the more equalizers, the more outputs, the more inputs you get. We have uh, different kinds of hardware. Okay. Like for example, these are called compressors, DSers, and uh, noise suppressors. Now, these this hardware helps you rectify things and make it sound better in different ways. Now, back in the days, we never had digital mixers like how we have now. Okay. We used to put racks of these hardware and they were connected to our, our consoles with um, a 31 band EQ and uh, not only that uh, you will at least have a rough idea as to what these things can do for you in a mix okay now when these when this hardware is connected to your console you can individually control your channels and and not only that, you can also um, make it sound good. Okay, so this hardware, once it's connected to your board, you have an option to control um, the amplitude of your input, and you can compress your input, you can gate your input, and much more things than that. Um. It's an analog board and most of the people in the church they are using these analog boards here. When using analog boards we were told that uh, we were told that we need to put the pots right up in zero dB and even all these ones, whatever you're using in zero dB, right? Correct. To make uh, use of the electronics within the board. Right. And so that only after that you adjust the volumes from here using the gain, right? Gain is here, right? So I wanted to know, is that applicable to digital boards also, or is it only in analog boards that we need to use this principle, you know? Whereas maybe digital boards, they are already incorporating, even though you use it below level also, they are having the full effects of the electronic within the board, right? So my question is, <coughs> whether you guys know that, that you need to put these parts all in zero so that it makes full use of the board. That's my first question to you guys. And then you adjust your volume or your gain using this one, you know? So that's my question. And also th my question to you was whether that's applicable to digital boards. Okay. Now, <coughs> you're talking about uh, first putting your failure up to zero decibels and then adjusting your gain. It's actually the other way around. Mm -hmm. You first adjust your gain and see what is your level, input level. Your input level should always be from the mics, from, from the, the microphone or your source <coughs> should always be at minus three dB, which you have a level indicator on your mixer. On all mixers, you have a level indicator. And if you all notice, and if you all actually take a look closely on your console, you'll have a button that says AFL or PFL. Now, the moment you press that, then the moment you enable it, it shows you the level indicator of your source. Okay. Now, the moment you start seeing green, it's a cold signal. Okay. So that means your signal is not very high. You have a decent <coughs> so sound floor or audio flow of your instrument or your source that's coming into your board. The moment it starts hitting yellow, that means, okay, you know, you should start stopping here. Yeah. The moment it hits red, you have a very hot input, meaning your source is very hot and you're going to have cracking, distortion, you'll have noises which you cannot control even if you try to do. Now, if you want to adjust that, you first keep your faders down, 
you check your source level how much signal is coming into your channel you adjust your gain control according to that let it be a digital console or an analog console in digital consoles it shows you the level you don't have to enable any buttons it shows you on the channel strip or on the meter bridge since it's a smaller console you don't have a meter bridge you just have a single meter bridge over here so you have a pfl or an afl button or a solo button on your console the moment you enable that you get to see your source input okay and the moment you start seeing your source input once you set it at minus 3 db or minus 6 db or zero then you can push your faders up your individual faders up to as much as you as much as you feel it's needed because if you have enough gain then you have enough headroom to play around with the faders if your source is soft and if you push a fader up full and turn your gain up then that one particular instrument or source is going to get louder okay so first set your gains that's very important the moment you set your gains then you put up your faders and balance it out yeah like how loud a guitar should be how loud a drum kit should be how loud a bass guitar should be so this is a very important thing that it's like basics 101 on sound you should know how much of gain and how much of input is coming into your console anything on the board that you would have a question about or uh, connections of the board that you would have a question about okay uh, just coming back to the GEQ uh, you said that earlier uh, that using the GEQ we can uh, cut the uh, noises and the feedbacks right. and uh, according to the frequencies that's causing all this uh, the, the problems um, my question would be um, how do you find out which is the frequency that's causing the feedback the high and the low frequencies how do you identify how do you identify that? You have something called as an RT emitter. Mm -hmm. It's called a real time analyzer. Mm -hmm. Now this I will explain to you all. If you use this uh, real time analyzer, this is going to show you all the 31 bands right from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And in the range whether it's your low frequency or your low mid, your high mid and your highs. If it's in that range, you get to cut that. You have to cut that. This I'll explain to you how it works and I'll also give you a demo of it. Once your speakers are analyzed, it, it uh, reduces and cuts off frequencies that are not required. Okay. It <coughs> makes your speakers sound flat no bass no mid no high so what you do on your mixer that's the sound that you will get on your speakers yeah as i said earlier uh, i've been watching a lot of uh, youtube tutorial videos and all that and they all have different op opinions uh, on how to use the GEQ and uh, what's that the mixer the fader strip uh, the channel strip and uh, some would say keep the GEQ flat and you play around with the channel strip uh, uh, the others they would say keep the channel strip flat and then you you know uh, move around with the GEQ. So a uh, little confused there. I don't know which way is the right the way to do it. The first thing you do is yeah. you first use the GEQ. Okay. You have to first use the GEQ. Then you use the equalizer on your mixer mm -hmm. because in your GEQ you have 31 bands and on your mixer you have four to six bands. Mm -hmm. So first you use the GEQ, then you use the, the equalizer on your control. This is the basic of a stage setup. Okay. Your basic stage setup would be your stage, your main PA speakers, your stage monitors, your source, which are your microphones, as I was explaining earlier. Then you have your crowd, and then you have your console. Okay. So, this is a very basic setup where you have four monitors on stage, four auxiliary sends for your console. And you have your main PA left and right. And then you have monitors and then you have your console. Where all your 
all your inputs are coming from the stage into your mixer through a snake box. Okay. Now, this is the kind of setup that you'll have in your church, right? Some of them would. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Has anyone gone for a live concert? Yes. You guys are into music, right? <laughs> now you're a smile. Okay. So, since you all are into music, then you all would have definitely gone for these big, big concerts, right? Mm -hmm. When bands and all play. Mm -hmm. You all have felt the sound hit you all, right? Yes. Why? Because it's loud. <laughs> no. In a way, yeah. Okay. Any other reasons? Because it's a vibration. Okay. Vibration. Wavelength in low frequencies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, your subs, your subwoofers, those are your low frequencies. Okay. That's what pushes the air. Okay. That's what pushes the air so that you feel the bass. Okay. And then you have your mids and your highs which carry the sound along with that. Okay. So you have three segregations of sound in your PA system which is your highs, your mids and your lows. Okay. It's something like this. You have <coughs> your low frequencies, you have your mid frequencies and then you have high frequencies. Okay. These three elements make a speaker box, a cabinet. Okay. So every cabinet has a different wattage, a different uh, input, impedance, these kind of things. Now when you connect this to an amplifier, it amplifies the sound to get much louder so that the sound can travel to the end. Okay. Maximum your speaker would throw is around 60 meters to 58 meters. Uh, beyond that, you would have to put a delay stack for your sound to carry on further. But um, we have line array systems which are directional sound and then you have your stacks i think you all are aware of these speakers right you all use this most of you guys use this right so yeah so basically you use um, your stack speakers now how do you get a stack speaker sounding right uh, just one question um, what should be the distance between the, the the speaker and uh, the empty and mixtures. So basically, we use the mixtures and amplifier, but all the equipments are just in front of the, the stage, just near the stage. Okay. So we put it uh, the amplifier, mixture, everything just near the, the speakers. Okay. So since we don't have uh, what we call a snake cable, you know. Correct. So should we use snake cable, and that should be the certain distance should be zero or how you have to use Good question. Okay, now, when you plug up your system, when you connect your system, you should, I, it's always recommended that you do use a snake, which is actually required because it makes life easier. Otherwise, you have one too many cables to pull to the stage. So by the time you look at the connections from your mixer to the stage, you have so many of them. And it's hard to rectify an issue. How many of you all have had that problem after you all connect the mixer with so many wires to the stage and you all don't know where the sound is coming from? Anyone? Now when you use the snake, it makes it easier because you just run one thick cable from your uh, console to the stage. Okay. So you have a snake box where you have all your inputs from the stage go into that and that gets connected to your mixer. Now generally when you are setting up a sound system, you keep your amplifiers behind your speakers so that you don't lose out on on the power that's being driven to your speakers through your amps and your console should always be in the center of, of a venue at 30 meters that is the only way you will be able to understand how loud your sound is how much of distance you're covering and how clear your mix is because if your mixer is in front of the stage it becomes hard for you to judge 
these kind of things because you're listening <coughs> to it from the front. You may find it sounding good, right? You'll say, wow, it sounds great from here. But once you go back, when you start walking further into a ground or further into an auditorium, it starts sounding completely different, right? Because you're not actually calculating the sound from the back, you're calculating the sound from the front. Now basically sound, it runs on calculation. Distance, throw, and SPL. Okay. SPL stands for sound pressure level, which is how loud your speaker gets. Now this is SPL. If you understand this, this is what a speaker is all about. Okay. I think uh, if you'll go to a shop, they talk about it being 1000 watts, 500 watts. Sometimes it's not always about the wattage of the speaker. It's about the SPL, how loud it gets. Even a lower wattage speaker has a very high SPL. And a high wattage speaker has a high SPL or it may sound as loud as the one that's got a softer SPL. You know, a softer, uh, less wattage. So these are the things that matter <coughs> in your sound system. <coughs> Before I continue, any other questions? Okay, I want to ask one question. Uh, when I increase the volume of monitor mm -hmm. feedback system, okay. that if I off, and I can even increase that front side speaker volume, so what is the reason? Okay, because you have your fader on pre and post. Okay. Your mixer cons contains a button that says pre post. And what console are you using? Uh, Yamaha. Yamaha. Yamaha, which one? MX U20. MC. Mm. You're using your MG122CX. 122 or 1224? It's a big one, blue color. Yeah. Yeah, it's 24 times. Uh, 20. That's a MG224 mixer. Now that console has four auxiliaries on it and you have a pre-pause button. Now, pre-fader, this one, yeah. So a pre-fader is when you put it on free, it, you can send sound to your monitor without the faders. Okay. So if you switch on, if you enable that button, if you push your fader down, you can send sound to your monitor without having to push the fader up. So, the main PA system, you can balance it out after you're done setting your monitors. Okay? Now, if you do not have a G equalizer, a graphic EQ connected to your monitors, then you keep your fader on post. So what happens is, your monitor and your PA system works with the fader. So now, when you control your fader, your monitor level also changes. Mm -hmm. So probably they tell you make it louder, so you push it up, it starts feedbacking. Uh, let me say something. Yeah. Um, going back to what we were talking about just a few minutes ago about the snake, and about being in front of the, the stage as opposed to being out in the audience somewhere. One thing I notice in Nagaland a lot, and sometimes it's the pastor that forces this, but uh, it's really a good idea for the the P, uh, for you as the engineer to not be behind glass or up way up in a balcony, um, the, the, the optimal place you would want to be is where the audience is. So if you can be, you know, in the center of the audience, um, you know, about two, two thirds way back into the audience, that's going to be the best place for you to be um, because you're hearing what the audience is hearing. If you're up in a uh, up in a balcony, then you're you're going to get what the balcony is hearing. Down below, it might sound terrible, but up in the balcony because you're mixing there, it sounds great. If you're behind a, a glass wall, I've seen I've seen one uh, one church in Dimapur that's like this. You know, they're they're completely uh, buried behind glass, and that glass is stopping you from from using your ears. So. I know there's some limitations for a lot of churches, but if you have an option to be able to move your board into a place that uh, is closer to where the audience is, where they're listening to, you're going to have, you're always going to have a better mix. Okay, before I get back to SPL, I was talking about cables, right, earlier, um, XLR cables and balanced and unbalanced cables. Now, um, most of you all use cables like this, jack-to-jacks. Okay. 
Now this is a mono cable. Okay, a mono cable is a single is a single source input. Okay. Um, now we use these cables for our our keyboards, our guitars, connecting a device to another device. Sometimes it's a speaker box to an amplifier, or your mixer to an amplifier. Certain things like that. And XLR to XLR, this is your balanced input. Now, why do we call it balanced input? Any answers? Now, if you notice, there are three pins on this. It's a ground, it's a left and a right. So that's two inputs. Okay. So it's a left input and a right input. So it makes the input source clear and it's much heavier and it sounds good so when you use a XLR cable it's called balanced input okay these are called balanced inputs these are called unbalanced inputs okay. so sometimes you'll have issues because your mixer or a device that you used has a balanced input and you're feeding it an unbalanced input that's why it doesn't sound right or it doesn't function properly you have feedback problem, you have um, you have a low input problem and these cables are actually very important if you notice in your hardware, in some of your mixers, you have a, a phono jack input on your board that sometimes takes a stereo in or a mono in. Okay, it says balanced and unbalanced. So sometimes if you put a, a stereo jack which has, over here you have one tip and one ring and in a stereo you have uh, one tip and two rings so what happens is you have um, a ground, you have a left and a right so that once you put it in, you get both the channels of your input source yeah? so it makes your device function properly if you, if you don't use a proper cable, if you don't understand how you, how you should connect your device properly I will explain all this to you in the second half, how we're going to do our connections, how we could make different cables okay, and uh, what kind of cables can be used for certain scenarios. Like when you're on stage, if you're patching up a guitar pedal, which I think most of you all have. Anyone's got a guitar pedal? No? Just for the movie is Okay. So at, in your church, your guitarist brings a guitar pedal, right? If you all notice, some of them have one single output and some of them have two outputs, which says left, oblique, mono and right. The moment you give the left source, you get a mono signal into your console. The moment you plug left and right, you're getting two sources into your, into your board. Okay, so then you pan them out, left and right to your PA system and you get a proper heavy signal that is being distributed equally between your PA system. Do you have a question? Yeah, okay. Then I'll expand on it just now. Uh, that effect, we have two output. Correct. Uh, but and then when we plug in this mixture, we have only one. So in order, in order to do that, I just uh, make it this on one side, I just put the, the buff. And plug it inside and then put it up, uh, right, left, and right. Why Is there any harm? Yeah, why okay, so does so you have a, a jack to jack cable which is one side a mono and the other side is left and right. Yes, I made it. You made it. Why do you? Yeah, why do you? Okay. No, no, that because it, uh, only left side sound come. Okay. So if I do like that, do sound come out. Okay. So when you're using a cable like that, you're actually shorting out two connections. You're, you're trying to put two positive connections together. You may hear the sound, but it's technically not correct. Okay. So for that, you have to have a balanced cable. Okay. You have to have a left and a right. Then you get a proper, you get a proper sound coming out of your device. If you short a device like that, if you cross connect it, your device is going to get damaged. Uh, what kind of cable we have to use? You have to use 
two mono cables like this. L like for example, you're using one of this, right? Yeah. This one's going into your mixer. Yeah. And you have another connection that's going into your pedal, right? Yeah. But when I see, when I open and see, the way I fix it is that one same, same money. They also they use it, they do it together. Okay. Like, it was a purchase from shop. Magic store. Okay. Yeah. That's still an unbalanced input if you notice it. Because if you're using one phono jack that's like this, like this, and the other sides are two, mm. it's still an unbalanced signal. It's not balanced. What pedal is it? What pedal is it? What pedal are you what pedal is it? Uh, effect, military effect. No, is it zoom or is zoom, it zoom? Yeah, zoom. Mm, zoom. Is it that an XLR? No. For these kind of things, like your keyboards, for example, yeah. when you plug a keyboard, always take two outputs out of your keyboard, not one. So that way, when you have two inputs balanced between your left speaker and your right speaker, you get the full octaves of your keyboard. You start to hear the full keyboard. Otherwise, if you know, if you if you notice, you only hear most of the time. You hear more of the low end. And the high end is like very sharp towards the ears. You have to trim it off. That's because you're getting a mono signal. When you use both the signals, it gets properly balanced between the left side of your keyboard and the right side of your keyboard. The same thing happens with your guitar pedals. Nothing. I, I use this one. That, uh, XLR? Yeah, XLR now. With this. XLR to phono jack. Uh, That's a band. That is balanced cable to an unbalanced cable. So basically, the output that's coming out of your keyboard is still unbalanced. But going into your mixer is balanced. But you're still getting a mono signal. You could use something called a DI box, a direct insert box. Now these, I didn't know you had this. <laughs> okay. Now, has anyone seen this before? Mm, yes. For the people who have? Okay. For the people who have not, this is called a DI box. Very important very safe for your sound setups let it be indoors outdoors or a studio it's very safe reason being is because this can convert a balanced signal to an unbalanced signal and give you a balanced output a proper balanced output okay this runs on a battery or something that's called a phantom power you'll have seen a phantom a plus 48 volts on yours makes up yes okay this runs with that. Okay. Now, this functions, or uh, the functionality of this is basically we keep it for safety, so that our uh, power doesn't travel from either side. If current is flowing from your keyboard or your or any source that's there on stage that contains current, if there is a leakage of power, that's going to get into your mixer directly and it's going to spoil a channel of yours. Now, if you use this, this stops that from happening. Okay. There is a cutoff inside it. It does not let your let power pass through this and get into your console. So if any damages happen, it happens to this. And not only that, you have um, a few switches on this, okay, which you can use to um, cut off like very hot signals coming from your stage like I was saying earlier suppose you have uh, very hot signals coming in like your guitar, guitars or keyboards or any other instrument that are burning red and when you turn the gain down it's still burning red has anyone come across that? Yes. it's still burning red, you can't control it how do you reduce it? if you use a DI box you have a minus 20 dB cutoff switch on this so the moment you enable it it gets softer by 20 dB by 20% it gets softer then you have a ground and lift. Suppose you have a buzz coming out of your guitar, which generally happens. When the moment you plug in your guitar pedal to your mixer, you have a, a buzzing sound. You can't fix that. You can't fix it. So if you enable that, that enables a ground, ground that cuts off that buzz. Okay. But the volume will with decrease of how the volume will be sent. You have a cutoff switch on this. It's up to you. 
if you want if you if you're getting if your signal is too high that's coming into your mixer then you enable this but if the signal flow into your console is the same then you don't need to enable it it stays the same they give you a feature which is ground lift so you can cut off any buzzing noise that comes from your from your device these things are very important to have around with you those are great for bass players because almost the bass is always clipping on the floor. Always clipping. That, that takes care of it just very quickly. I have a question uh, to do with uh, the sound mixing and, I mean, while we're doing the sound mixing and the sound check, uh, which should we do first, the stage monitors or the house speakers? You always first do the stage monitoring. Okay. Okay. First you set your levels on your console. Very important. First, get your source of sound into your console. See that all your first you do a line check. First, check your mm -hmm. mixer. Put up all the faders. Check the lines to see there's no buzzing sound. If your signal is passing correctly into your mixer, then you'll start adjusting the gains. How much of input is going to come into your board? Okay. After that, you'll start checking, you know, individual channels. Then you start putting your monitoring, you know. Then after you start putting your monitors up, you switch the PA off so that the band is still, or the artist is still listening to what's happening, you know, what they're playing. Then you ask them what they need, what gets louder on stage. You want more vocals, you want more bass, you want more guitars, you want more keyboard. Then after you're done balancing, balancing the stage out, then you bring your PA back in. Yeah. So then, you know, the band or the artist is getting a reference between their monitors and the PA system. So that will solve your monitoring issue. And that way you get to set the exact amount of, of uh, sound for the stage, you know. So you know how loud the stage is. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to turn up anything a little extra, you know. In case if they do need it, then in, in the mix, you can increase it slightly so that you know, they are very comfortable on stage. So these things are very important to know. Can I add something to that? Um, this has nothing to do with the technical side of it. Um, uh, in the US, um, we, we had a practice on a Thursday and then we had, our, uh, we had a Saturday and Sunday service. Um, me as a technician, on that Thursday, I would spend more time down on the stage um, going back to my board and making adjustments and going back down to the stage and making sure that artists are comfortable with their mix. Um, one of the very most important things as a sound engineer is that you have a good relationship with um, the, the people that you are, are uh, helping. Um, if, they, if there is a trust issue, they'll always have a complaint. They'll complain that you know this doesn't sound right. I don't know what's I don't know what it sounds, but it, it just doesn't sound right, you know. Or there'll there'll be some complaint from um, you know the pastor or somebody. Um, I spend more time as a sound engineer. Um, I wouldn't say hand holding, but sometimes you have to do that. You have to you have to work with the the singer or the the bass player or the. The, the guitarist or whoever um, to make sure that they're happy with their sound and if you get to the point week in a week after they'll just trust you they won't they won't so much complain they'll they'll just know hey Bob's on it he'll take care of it um, but if you get to that position um, and you're walking down to the stage I always walk you know right where the right where the singer is he's singing right here I'm literally right here listening to what he's listening to and then I'll, I'll with my own ear, I'll know. Okay, she she really can't hear the uh, the keyboard. So let me go ahead and walk over to my board and turn up the the guitar a little bit into the monitor. If you get to the position where you're listening to what they're listening to, um, most of the time they're not going to complain. And then the Sunday morning practice is when I really start listening to more of the the audience. Um, empty auditorium mix and a full auditorium mix. Or when your church service, you're having a rehearsal, is always empty, just the band and you guys, 
and a few other people around. So when you all start doing your sound check and when the band is doing their rehearsals, it seems very noisy and loud. Right? It echoes. There is an echo and there's a lot of resonating sound that causes quite a few uh, quite a lot of feedback on your stage as well. Right. Now when you have a when you have an open auditorium and when your venue is open, sound is just traveling, you know, and if it's a closed auditorium it's even worse because it's gonna hit the wall and come back. When the place wherever you're having a band playing or any such thing or when it's full of people, it starts sounding better. Yeah. Any reason why? Does anyone know? <coughs> yeah, people, they absorb the sound. Correct. Mm. Clothes absorb the sound. Okay. Because not every place is acoustically, acoustically treated. Right. So if you were in a room and it didn't have carpeting on the wall or if there wasn't any color on the wall, that's going to cause a lot of reflection. Okay. We call it reflection sound. So it reflects. So when you speak, like as of now I'm speaking, my voice is completely dead because you hear it and there's nothing extra with that. Right? But if this hall was not treated, it would echo. Because there is something called as a jargon. When you clap, it's sound that goes left and right, up and down, and front and backwards, continuously at the same time. So it's sound traveling all over the, all over the room at the same time. It's a step of hall. Yeah. We have to use when, volume, sound, or how. When you're in an or when you're in an empty auditorium, or if you're in your church that echoes a lot when it's empty, then you. You have to balance your band or the artist or whoever speaking, you have to balance it according to what you feel is sounding right. You know, you have to cut the correct frequencies, you have to know what to cut and what to boost. Like, for example, if you speak into a microphone and you find there is too much of bass, there's a lot of bass in your microphone, you cut down the bass slightly. You just cut down the bass slightly. Because what happens is generally what happens when people are doing when you're going to set up a microphone. How many of you have dropped mics? Come on, now I want a response. How many people have dropped down a microphone? I think one of you would have dropped or keep dropping microphones. Now what happens is when you drop a mic the diaphragm that's there gets stuck to the magnet. That makes the high end of your microphone, the mids and highs, it gets dampened because the diaphragm is not moving. When you speak, it can't actually get your full voice cut. That's why the microphone starts sounding very bass heavy. If you buy a new microphone and you put an old microphone and you check the difference, you understand what I'm talking about. We'll try and do that in the second half of my session and get an amp and we'll, I'll show you what, what the, how that works because if you have a microphone that's bass heavy then you just have to cut the bass down and a mixing tip a mixing tip for the guys who, have, who do this who do mixing on stage if anyone says um, there's too much of bass you know or just increase the highs on my mixer I want a little bit more highs in my monitor or you know I want a little bit more mid in my in my mix how do you do that you don't turn the knobs up you cut frequencies like if anyone wants a little bit more highs in their voice just trim the lows down a little bit if anyone wants a little bit more lows in their voice trim the highs down a little bit because those are the those are the elements that are that are clashing and disturbing them on stage, and it solves your problem because if you put up your fader, or if you put the auxiliary send up a little bit more, it will not fade back. 
one thing to add. Um, just a small trick. If um, if it's a church where they always complain it's too loud, and somebody says the bass is too loud, I usually turn everything else down but the but the bass. Um, or yeah, turn every um, all the, all yeah the all the other ones down. It reduces the volume. Uh, or I'm saying I'm sorry. The the bass is too low. I bring everything else down, and then you you reduce your volume by a couple of dB, and the church becomes happier because it's not as loud. Um, so instead of you know turning up the bass and in a loud setting, you can turn everything else down. So if you guys find anything a little too loud, bring the rest. You know, bring that down. If anyone wants a little bit more of that one particular instrument, you bring the rest of the stuff down. So that way you're not damaging your amplifiers, you're not clipping your mixer, and you still have enough headroom in your in your console, so if you want to give them a little bit more during a particular point of time, you can. Now, we have something called as subgroups on a mixer. You all's analog, both would have, you all would have seen subgroups, right? Now, what a subgroup does is generally people put everything on a subgroup and give it like an auxiliary and or give it for a or a microphone feed or something like that. But it makes your it makes your mix much easier to handle a vast number of channels. Okay. Suppose you have four groups on your mixer. It says group one and two, group three and four. Mm -hmm. Now you could take your full band, okay, or only your drums, or only your guitars or your vocals, and put them on a group. And just control like eight faders with just two of them. Yeah. So it's like instead of you trying to figure out how to control all the volumes because you have that many channels, you just s switch all of them to a group and you can either increase them or you could decrease them. Yeah. So that's what a subgroup does. So generally when we do multiple channel inputs like somewhere around 36 to 48 of them we have like eight banks of groups so we shift drums bass guitars keys so we have just eight elements in our hand to play with you know like if we have 48 inputs okay you're not going to be able to control all 48 at the same time right so we group them up drums will be on my first fader my guitars will be on my second fader so as you look at the band on stage, you have that many controls on your on your console. You know, so you can individually control the drums, the bass, the guitar, the keyboards. So you, it makes it easier for you to balance out your band and make it sound much more clear. Yeah. So suppose if you're having a four-piece band, okay, four-piece drums, guitars, keyboard, vocals. Okay. And a bass guitar. Take five bass, okay? Now, what we do is, if, um, suppose when your show starts, you find the vocals are a little too soft. Okay. The vocals are not coming out of the mix. What will you cut down? How will you know what to cut down? You're not going to bring all 38 channels or 20 channels right down, right? So you put these guys on a group. So if you find the band is too loud, you can just bring the band down and keep the vocals up. Yeah. So if you want to put a little bit more keyboards during a keyboard solo, or if you want a guitar guitar solo, you can just individually play with all of them. So it makes it easier for you to balance out your band and make the mix sound as clean as possible. Any questions? You said that we'll keep the keyboards in a in a group. So before coming to there, because if we keep in a group, then if once we move the feather or up and down, then it will it will uh, move the volume of the keyboard in an overall position, right? Overall That's only for the outside, not for the inside. The group faders do not affect the monitors at all. Okay. It only affects the PA system. So we have to first adjust the keyboard separately then? Yes. So basically, you, like I was saying, the moment your keyboard comes into your mixer, then you equalize it to whatever you want. 
then you send the monitors to them as loud as they want it and as comfortable they are on stage with the sound. Once you're done with that, then you shift your channels to your group, right? So that you, if suppose you have like four faders of keyboards, you have two keyboards, you can't play with all four faders at the same time, right? You're not going to keep your hand, two hands on faders moving them up and down, right? So you shift them to a group which makes it one fader. All four channels will go to one fader and it becomes easier to control both the keyboards with just one fader. And that only affects the PA system. It does not have anything to do with your monitors. When he says shift um, that channel or those keyboards over to a, um, a subgroup, there will be a button on your board that says one, two, three, three four. four. You can, or five, six, depending on how many groups you have. You can just enable press that button or enable it and it will it'll be pushed over to that. Uh, that subgroup. Yeah, um, and you also have a button that says LR or it says mix. You have to take it out of that mix because what happens is you got a stereo button. The moment you enable that, the sound from that channel is coming to your master output. Master output. So if in if you want that to be dedicated just to that group, you have to get it out of the out of the stereo mix and enable the group one and two or three and four, five and six as per whatever you want to shift your keyboards or guitars too. So the moment it is out of that mix, then your groups are going directly to your to your stereo. So it will not affect anything else on your consoles. It will just become an additional volume control uh, of that of that particular mix. So you know you can just play with that. You don't need to touch any of the balance of the faders that are there on your console. Any questions? Please, uh, apart from the equalizer, yeah. apart from high, mid, low, there is one more. What is that? That is a frequency. frequency. Yeah, now that's your full mid frequency range. Like how you want your mid to sound. Like for example, if you have a ring, when someone says check, there's a ring. Mm. There's a ring when he says check. So according to that, according to that mid frequency, what you want to cut off, you set the gain up, you search for the frequency that's feedbacking and then you cut it down slightly. So that takes away that ringing sound. So you have a high frequency, which is a set frequency. You have a low frequency, which is one set frequency. And you have a mid, which is a sweep, which you can sweep between that bandwidth, between that frequency range on your console. Do you like to say something also? Or do you want to say something? I've been saying, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, just the only thing that I would add to the subgroup um, that we were talking about, and I was talking about volume earlier. Um, in my church, you know, in the U.S., uh, I, I ran a 56-channel board and a, a, another 24-channel board next to it um, for orchestra, for choir. We had a usually a 10-piece band and then uh, up to up to 10 vocals up on the stage. It is impossible to keep track of all of those channels when you're when you're mixing in a live setting. I always change the sound depending on um, the, the type of song it is. Um, there's one song that is very heavy in electric guitar where the other song it's very contemporary and more you know keyboards and, and more into the vocals. Those subgroups are very important because instead of going and looking for those channels, um, even though they are labeled, it's still difficult. So with those with those subgroups you can turn up the the vocals on one one song and bring down the, the electric. Um, if uh, earlier I mentioned you know the bass is too low, um, I'll just bring all of those other subgroups down a little bit and then the, the bass increases. Okay. Um, your 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 ear uh, doesn't remember beyond 20 seconds. So somebody up on stage, they're like, hey, why did I turn down? But in a, in a few seconds, they're not going to they're not going to understand that their volume actually came down. So it's 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 very useful. And if you're, I mean, if it's very good for choir microphones. Every, uh, just about every uh, everybody here uses microphones for for choirs. Put those on a on a subgroup. Because um, sometimes the the band is too loud, and then you can just you can try and push push those all of those four microphones or six microphones that are using up in that subgroup instead of 
adjusting them individually on the board. So subgroups are very important. And every every um, church that I've consulted here in Nagaland, I always see those subgroups not being used. And that's one of your biggest um, um, your biggest uh, assets on your board. So I would definitely encourage all of you to use those. Question here again. Um, earlier you said about the ringing thing, the yeah. ringing sound. Uh, does that usually come from uh, the mid frequencies or? Most of the time that come from the high mid frequency okay. range. The high mid frequency, okay. Yes. okay, thank you. There's something in the mm -hmm. room called a residence frequency as well. Okay. And that's something that can be fixed inside a graphic CQ or okay. a parametric. Okay. Um, any last questions before we break for tea? Um, Richard mentioned earlier that um, you can write down your questions and bring them forward. Um, as we're breaking for tea, why don't you bring those and put them on the table and uh, they'll, we'll answer you know, all of them.